We have a lot to get to because you are very, very busy in the AI space, but I would be remiss given the state of the world today and just the breaking news even before this event started um, if I didn't ask you a big macro question first just to kick this off and that is you're the CEO of one of the biggest global conglomerates in the world um, geopolitical risk supply chain risk whether it's port strikes whether it's what we're seeing play out in the Middle East right now with um, with Israel and Iran yes these are well telegraphed situations but how are you navigating them so look, uh, I would say the world is definitely in a more tougher spot now versus it was start of the year. No war is good. Uh, wars are bad for economy, bad for people. Uh, so I, I see the situation uh, between election uncertainty and war just being uh, less exciting today versus if you had asked me the same question in January. But at the same time, there are a lot of exciting opportunities in pockets. So aerospace is a big segment for us. There's a lot of growth there. Everybody knows about AI, data center, utility story, energy transition. So companies like us have to manage these uncertainties all the time. Uh, things like weather issues, port strikes are kind of becoming, unfortunately, table stakes for us. It just happens so frequently that we have to manage our operating system to deal with it and also deal with geopolitical circumstances. But overall, I would say I remain optimistic. You always have to find good and bad and uh, continue to drive the business. Okay. So... How does AI, for example, and all of this technology that is now at our fingertips, how does that help you to navigate all of that uncertainty? So I would say AI for industrial has a different context compared to AI what we all hear in our daily life. So you know, as a consumer, we get excited on use of AI for writing my resume or making a great recommendation for a restaurant. And it's all our software development, and there's a lot of conversation around that. But there's less conversation around how AI will impact an industrial company, company like us which serves aerospace segment, energy segment, buildings, which touch everybody's lives, but we don't observe it. And the biggest challenge for industrial world is that any, everything we do has to be deterministic. It means uh, probability-based systems don't work for us. So if AI recommended you a restaurant and you didn't happen to like it, you can just shrug your shoulder and never mind, I won't do it again but it doesn't work in industrial context. Things have to work precisely the way they are supposed to be. Uh, so if you have a smoke detector in your kitchen, it's supposed to send, send smoke. You can't say maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's going to be very uh, hazardous in that case. So our opportunity is take the two biggest problems which the industrial companies have, shortage of skills, shortage of workers, and general drive towards productivity, and how do we leverage AI in that context while we maintain the basic principle of deterministic solution. So it's exciting. I would say uh, we want to make sure that there's as much visibility to industrial conversation on AI, which is, to me, is a pathway to autonomy. So autonomous journey, autonomous car is great, but autonomous industrials are equally great. Think about an autonomous plane, autonomous building, autonomous warehouse, autonomous plant. AI is a pathway towards that, and that's why it's very exciting for us opportunity that it creates for our customers and for us as from a business perspective. So we're really not talking about chatbots here. Um, we think about generative AI and everything sort of being thrown in that mm. bucket willy-nilly, but that's not what we're talking about, and those are not the capabilities we're talking about when we talk about no. industrial AI. What are some examples? So examples would be, think of an industrial company into, typically it's good to define industrial into three buckets. They all own an asset. They will have a physical asset, a warehouse or a plant or a building, so there's an asset-related uh, opportunities exist. Then they have a lot of processes to done, do their work, and then they have people. And AI will have opportunities across each one of them, and I'll, I'll give you an example of each one. Uh, the easiest one is always to explain people, so let's go to the easy one. Uh, the skills uh, availability of people to run these operations is one of the bigger challenge to our customer world. So think about operators, technician, uh, even pilots. There's a general uh, shortage of that. The underlying fact means the, the continued uh, diminishing birth rates in industrial world. It's, uh, you know, well telegraphed uh, story. So that is leading to now less people available for doing the jobs which, are, uh, which were very popular 20, 25 years back or less popular today. So what AI does is that if a job required a 15-year, 20-year experience human, you can have a five-year human to do the job because you can have two so-called co-pilots in our, in our context. And that makes more productivity, uh, more people available, versus you want to do a job for a, you know, uh, with, with that level of experience. 
Example I always give is uh, if I have to drive in New York without Google Maps, I will never go anywhere. I'll just, I'll just go, and go around and never find my way. But Google Maps takes me there, so it's an AI pilot in that context. And I'm a good driver, so a novice driver in New York can be effective because of AI. So similar example if you put in context of uh, industrial equipment, uh, industrial process. So that's where people are getting excited to use co-pilots in context of uh, you know, industrial. So that's one example. In case of work processes, uh, you know, we all hear a lot about AI being used for software development, right? There's a lot of uh, discussion on coding. Coding can be done much faster. It's bringing massive productivity. But uh, most industrial companies don't write software. Uh, so for them, that's interesting. Uh, it doesn't do anything for them. But they all build a lot of assets. They will uh, expand their plants, expand their facilities, make more infrastructure, make more buildings. So they always do a lot of capital spend. So capital spend required a project. It means you have to write specifications. Specification writing takes a lot of time. But you can automate that, too, the way you can automate software coding. And that's the area we are focusing on, because that's less about productivity, but more about making it faster. So think about if I have to make this building, and writing the specification took six months. And there are 100 buildings like this which already has been built. And I can now write specification in 15 days. I cut cycle time of this project by five months. So that's a lot of money in, in that example. So the process efficiency is like that. And then to the physical asset itself, I think there are efficiency to run these assets more faster. You have a lot, lot more data available. So you use AI to find trends and find uh, uh, you know, the signals so that you can operate your assets more, uh, you know, more efficiently. So we find opportunities to run the assets better, to make people more productive, and make your processes more efficient. And all that is what I call autonomy, you know, because this is a path towards autonomy. Uh, and that's what excites us, and that excites our customers. And so, of course, I would imagine you're applying some of this internally, but really what you're laying out, especially given the fact that you're building off of what's already a really big, robust sensor business, what's mm -hmm. already a software platform yeah. with Forge, this is what you're looking to now sell and market to your end customers across industries. Right, absolutely. So a good, good, a good uh, story here to tell would be, uh, you know, we, we are one of the big providers of uh, fire systems. So when you see a smoke detector somewhere in your office or your home, there's a high probability it's of Honeywell. Uh, those smoke detectors produce an alarm, and that alarm has to go somewhere so that, uh, you know, the emergency uh, uh, people can come in in event of an emergency. And we are collecting all those products to our cloud. So, so why does it matter? You know, what are you going to do with that? Because now you can see uh, which uh, products are up for replacement because they have a finite life. Uh, so that helps. You're able to find the service calls much more diligently. So now the connectivity, connecting our products to our cloud is creating new set of service opportunities for us, but also higher service levels for our customers. And that's going to happen across the segment we serve, be it energy segment. In, our, in, in aerospace, uh, we will soon launch, if we have not launched it, but probably coming up in next uh, couple of months is uh, ability to connect our engines. You say, why you want to connect an engine of the plane? We supply engines for the mid-size planes because now you get to see the engine performance proactively because you have defined rules. So when it comes to maintenance shop, you already know how to repair it. So you have far more productive hours. So it's all about getting smarter in how to use the assets. And we see number of use cases on how to apply data and AI rule set in context of industries we serve in a very exciting manner. Mm. You said a lot there. And I do want to let the audience know that we will be taking questions here in just a moment. Um, but first, to, to go off of what you just said, what does the trajectory of adoption look like? Right now, I would say uh, adoption is low because uh, this is something which uh, customers are looking for more, more robust use cases. And that's our job to make sure that they understand what is the economic case here, right? I mean, uh, and so awareness is high, adoption is low. But I would say adoption will go, there's a going to be an inflection point. Uh, we have seen inflection happening in certain verticals we serve. As any other inflection, slow, and then it ramps up when, when few people adopt it. So I do believe that 25, 26 is going to be a big year of adoption of AI in context of industrials. Interesting. That's right around the corner. Yeah. Um, 
the labor piece of this, mm -hmm. because you touched on something that I thought was very interesting and using pilot shortage as an example. It sounds like it's about boosting productivity, not necessarily replacing jobs, but maybe perhaps adding more jobs? Absolutely. I mean, I look at uh, AI as a revenue generating opportunity in context of industrials because uh, the shortage of skill is the heart of the issue for us for most part. And think about it, if I, if I take example of our aerospace business, we are having a labor shortages for three years, and that's a constraint to grow revenue. So it's, for us, the biggest revenue constraint is lack of skilled labor. So if I can solve that issue, it's a growth enabler and not productivity enabler. So I see fundamentally for industrials, for most part, AI is going to be an enabler for driving growth versus being an enabler for productivity. I mean, you do see this debate about the fact that you know, potentially you are going to see some jobs go away. And what's notable about this particular tech revolution is that maybe it's white collar jobs, which hasn't always happened historically. Yeah. So I guess what do historical tech adoption trends tell us, and what does that mean for reskilling? Yes, reskilling here will be, uh, I think the good news is AI also helps you to reskill yourself quickly because you can adopt tools and do purpose built learning. Uh, so I, I think you're spot on that a lot of AI is on the white collar jobs, and we have to be mindful that we have to reskill ourselves where these tools are coming uh, to, to move ourselves up in the, up in the value chain. For, I, I, for me, I've been working now for 35 years. There's always a trend which is makes your skill obsolete. That comes every five, seven years. Think about robotics process automation was a big deal in 2017 and 2018, and we all said it's going to take away all jobs. And here we are, six years down the line, nobody remembers that. To me, the skill churn in a, in a, in a white-collar job is a continuous evolution. And AI is in early innings. It's just going to get deeper. So I think we all have to think about from industrial perspective, how do we use that for, for good? how we reskill our people. So we are doing a lot more tools to make our people more productive. Because fundamentally, I don't believe that for a company like us, it's a uh, uh, labor uh, uh, productivity opportunity is way smaller for us versus a growth opportunity, which I mentioned before.